Hello, this is Glenn Heckove, and welcome back to the Solvable Mysteries podcast. This special extras episode is one that will not have your ass. As we mentioned before, he's on a trip this week, and uh, he already let me know he was definitely missing being on an episode this week. So don't worry, he'll be back next week with his usual enthusiasm and his high quality shows, which I know all of you enjoy. In the meantime, you're stuck with me. Oh, Jesus. I know. So, you know, if you're a fan of my work, then maybe you'll enjoy this episode. And if not, well, uh, (laughs) bad news, because you got two hours of me coming up this episode right now. And then after this, I'm going to do another episode about UFO updates. So stay tuned for later in the week. Okay, so let's get to our case today. Our case today, as you saw from the intro, is a Boy Scout named Jared Negrete. Now, what's interesting about Jared Negrete is that he was a Boy Scout literally at the same time I was. In fact, I remember when this thing happened, all of us Boy Scouts in my troop were trying to figure out how it happened because we were kind of mystified at the time how someone could just disappear like that. It didn't really seem possible for reasons that I'll go into. However, as you'll see in the middle of this video, I came to some discoveries uh, that really put my mind at ease about what may have happened and I think gave me a much more charitable view and much more sympathetic and empathetic view of what happened to Jared. It's also worth mentioning that this video is going to be probably about as fact-filled as the other videos, but the emphasis is really not as much on giving a complete and super accurate recounting of what happened because I think there's plenty of other content that does that. I think what I bring to the table is that I was a Boy Scout at the exact same time Jared Negrete was. I have insight into probably very similar challenges in terms of getting along in a troop, these kind of trips, especially the high mountain hiking, and specifically because he also was from Southern California. I think I also have insight into the exact kind of terrain that he was hiking in because I also struggled on these high mountain hikes and they were definitely not my favorite, though they were very beautiful in terms of the scenery you could see. So from that perspective, I think that maybe I have a lot more in common with Jared Negrete than a lot of the other people that have done content about this so far. And, you know, I think it's also a good chance for me to give you some personal insights into, let's say, growing up as a Boy Scout in the late 80s and early 90s. some of the policies about Boy Scouts in terms of like maybe what went wrong, what went right in this trip, uh, very little. Uh, And also kind of some insights into some of the rules and I hope ultimately some lessons learned in terms of wilderness survival and what to do if you get lost. So from that perspective, let's go ahead and jump into the case. The place that Jared Negrete was last seen is San Gorgonio Mountain. But first, let's rewind and talk a little bit about the background of Jared Negrete. Jared Negrete was from a place called El Monte, California, which I'm going to bring up right here. And you can see there's a little bit of a distance between that and where he was last seen. So El Monte, California is very similar to where I live in terms of, uh, you know, it's Southern California. It's part of L.A. County, I believe. Uh, It has probably similar levels of diversity and socioeconomic mixtures of people in the area. Um, And he was actually part of the Long Beach Council. So Long Beach is a little bit further than I thought it would be, but it makes sense. Apparently, probably this whole area, uh, that's the, the council or the grouping for Boy Scouts of America that he would have fallen under. Now, these groupings under Boy Scouts They're budgeted for certain camps and certain activities. So in this case, his camp, which is called Camp to Quits, was over here in Big Bear Mountain. And I looked at it on the map, and then in a second, we're going to look at it uh, in Google. And it looks like a nice little camp. I'd never heard of it before, probably because I belong to a different council. So my Boy Scout camps were over in Catalina and in the Sierras, uh, and they were fairly famous. Camp Emerald Bay, uh, rest in peace. But yeah, it's it's pretty interesting to look at what other camps, other troops are going to. 
here's Camp to, to Quits. And I thought it was pretty interesting to look at it and kind of get a sense for where it was at. Uh, if you look at it right now, these days it looks like they do quite a, a number of great activities. Um, I'm assuming this has been a little bit shined up since the day, you know, since 1991. I don't know that they had like all of this repelling stuff and all these activities. But, you know, it's up there in the mountains. I think it's a really great location. I mean, it's at 6,000 feet, it's pretty high elevation. So it's probably pretty dry and you're probably already sucking wind a little bit. That's something I'm going to get into in a little bit is how when you're up there in these high elevation areas, if you're not used to it, it can really start to wear on you. And I think anybody that's ever been to like uh, high mountains anywhere, but even like a city like Denver, which is already, I think, at pretty close to the same elevation, anything higher than that, you really start to feel it and get some health effects. And some people are affected more than others. But as I'm looking at this, I mean, it does look like a nice quaint little camp. Certainly looks like it would have been a lot of fun. Now it's, it's worth mentioning that the troop that Jared was with was actually a pretty small troop. Uh, it was only five people and an adult leader. And that is definitely not a very big troop. That's pretty tiny. I mean, if you think about it in terms of like, you know, uh, my troop probably had, depending on the year, between 25 and 45 boys, I would say, plus probably as many as 12 to 15 adult leaders because parents tend to get involved with things. Um, in this case, there was only one adult leader. I believe his name is Dennis Knight. And he had five teenagers to take care of. Now, I don't know that that's such a great idea. Um, maybe this is just an unfortunate reality of his troop. Uh, I think his troop may have been part of the Mormon church. So I do know that there's troops that are ex expressly for that purpose where because of restrictions about what days you can be out, just wanting to be around people of your same religion, there are troops that are called like LDS troops, Latter-day Saints troops, and you know they tend to do things together. It may be that the community he was from was relatively small in terms of the population of that. And that's why it was such a small troop. But I can't help but but notice that you know it, uh, it almost would have been better for them to join a bigger troop because I don't know as an adult that it's so great to be managing even five teenagers by yourself and and as we will find out it really isn't so good in terms of like the policies of Boy Scouts and even just general safety to have only one adult for five teenagers in a big hike like that and that's kind of what happened so okay so jared as i mentioned he was born september 11th 1978 he is about two years younger than me uh if he was still alive now and at the time uh and i remember definitely this event because like i said i, I was just a little bit older than him and all of us in the troop when we heard about this we were a little bit baffled because frankly we'd never heard about anything like this happening before some of that was just our limited experience some of that had to do with just this not being a super common event for, you know, these kind of activities. Uh, Jared was five foot two. He was 150 pounds. Uh, distinguishing characteristics, uh, Latino male, black hair, brown eyes. Uh, he had a small birthmark and wore glasses with brown plastic rims, which is interesting because in the pictures of him, I don't actually see any glasses. So it makes you wonder if he only wore them some of the time. Uh, he was last seen wearing a tan colored t-shirt which may have been Boy Scout style. Uh, I say for sure that's Boy Scout style. The green Boy Scout pants, which I definitely remember. Uh, those pants were like a combination of slacks and active wear. And I used to not like them so much. They looked pretty goofy. But, you know, now I'm kind of like, oh, they were, they were practical. You'd have to wear them every, let's say, Tuesday night at our meetings. And I always kind of resented them a little bit. And I think this is interesting. It says here he was wearing a pair of black high top pro wing sneakers so the high top's good because when you're hiking you have to worry about you know stepping wrong and, and breaking your ankle or spraining your ankle that's not good in the wild um, that could be like an emergency trip unto itself uh, if you get stranded up there but I don't know that sneakers have really great traction they tend to have kind of smooth bottoms uh, and especially they've been used a lot they tend to be worn kind of smooth so I don't know that that's so good for for hiking out there um, really quickly, let's get into a little bit of the data about Mount San Gorgonio. Uh, apparently, it's known locally as Old Greyback. 
Uh, official name is San Gorgonio Mountain, but Mount San Gorgonio is the local name. Uh, it is the highest peak in Southern California and the transverse ranges. So you can see what the transverse ranges are here. They're essentially a, a line of mountains that go across, let's say, Ventura and Los Angeles counties uh, down here in Southern California. Um, and it's part of the San Gorgonio wilder Wilderness. Uh, part of the Sand to Snow National Monument. Uh, so b by that, they mean that you literally have this bunch of mountains, uh, as you can see on the on the Google Earth, where like on Google Earth, there's definitely a lot of snow in the area when they took this picture here. I mean, let's go ahead and just drag it out real quick, just like I'm dragging out the show. And... Here's Camp, Camp to Quits, and you can see when they took the picture, they probably took this picture, this satellite photo of the mountain, um, I'm guessing either in the winter or the spring, when there's still snow up there, and it probably was during a year when they had a good rainfall. But, you know, I mean, the elevation's high. The elevation is 11,503 feet, which for California is high. I mean, we don't have a lot of mountains that are higher than that. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit because... I've been on two different mountains that have been, let's say, in this ballpark. Um, it was all both times was with was when I was with Boy Scouts. Um, both times, I had a heck of a time, and it turns out that one of the issues for people is something called altitude sickness, and I think it's a little confusing for people that don't have it happen because. You know, you don't really understand what the problem is with this other person. And by altitude sickness, I mean like getting lightheaded, feeling very, um, feeling like you lost your breath or having a hard time catching your breath again. Um, you're going to feel tired. Your muscles are literally not getting as much oxygen. So what would be not a lot of exertion before suddenly becomes a lot of exertion and you'll start to get very tired and you know, it can be very frustrating when you're trying to accomplish a big hike. And unfortunately for Jared Negrete, that was exactly what they were going to do on that Friday. So that Friday in July in 1991, they were going to take a hike from Camp to Quits over here, and they were going to go up a trail. And what's not clear to me is whether they had dr driven all the way around to another point. And that's what I don't unfortunately have a letter, a little detail. I mean, you would, you'd almost think like it might be shorter just to walk if they have a trail straight across here. And maybe that's part of the confusion is there's this mountain, like many mountains, has many trails. And I think that was part of the undoing when you look at the fact that they were kind of short staffed to manage even a, a small number of, of teenagers or teenage boys. And the goal was to get to the top of the peak. And Going back to my own experience, I've been to two mountains that have been sort of in the California area that are, are similar heights. So one was Mount Baden-Powell. Um, I did that when I was 17, so way older than Jared. Um, and that peak kind of kicked my butt a little bit. You know, that one was only 9,400 feet tall. And I was 17. I was in the best shape of my life. Like, I don't think I've ever been in such good shape as then. Uh, at least not aerobically in my weight to muscle balance. And yeah, I, I was definitely feeling it. Like I remember I was complaining the whole way. I was not happy. You get to the top, the top's really cold, even in spring or summer. Um, just the altitude equals <laughs> not a lot of heat. And yeah, and then, then I, when I was Jared's age, we did another trip to Mount San, Mount San Jacinto, which is over here, actually just adjacent to Palm Springs. You, you'll see it. If you ever drive to Palm Springs from LA, as you come in the freeway right over here, you're going to cross and you're going to see this very prominent mountain. It's pretty awesome because you can take a, a cable car right up the side of the mountain. Um, you, in fact, you have to, to even begin the hike. And you, you get, end up at a station up the mountain and then you take a trail up to the top. And it's only about three or four mile hike. But once again, that thing really kicked my ass like I was 12 and I had just come off a summer camp where I'd done some amazing performance so I see here it's about 10,839 feet so still about a thousand feet shorter than San Gorgonio but yeah I had just like literally been the fastest swimmer in the whole Boy Scout camp that I had been at the summer before that and that summer 
you know, I'm there at the this hike and I am like the last one and I am dragging behind like by a quarter mile of the rest of the troop. My dad's back there with me. He's probably mortified because like he wants to get up there and get up the mountain with everybody else. And I'm just like complaining and lagging and I can't breathe. And, you know, meanwhile, other kids weren't feeling it at all. So that really gives you a sense for the difference in altitude sickness and how it can affect people. Okay. So as we continue on this, this dialogue, let's go back to who the case is about, Jared. And if you look, let's go back really quickly. If you go back to Mount San Gregorio, the story is, and the facts differ a little bit in terms of what actually happened that day. But apparently on the hike, things were going well. Jared was in good spirits. Um, he had some belongings with him. So his belongings included a little, uh, it's funny now that everything's digital, uh, that these existed, but he had one of those little like, uh, uh, he, he, he had a little camera with him that was, you know, just took simple shots, didn't have any kind of complicated lenses or zoom lenses. It was just like a kind of a quick pick camera. Uh, he had a canteen with him. He had some snacks with him which we'll find out about later. So we had like beef jerky and maybe a candy bar or snack bar with him. Um, and he was enthusiastic and he was definitely, I think, glad to be part of the group there. And the story kind of varies a little bit at this point because what happens is the story either goes that the troop leader, Dennis Knight, noticed that Jared was lagging behind and asked him to stay behind since he was holding back the troop and they were trying to get up and down the hill before it got dark because you definitely don't want to be out there in the dark. That's one version. The other version of the story is that other hikers outside of the troop who were also on the trail came up behind them, noticed that Jared was lagging, and then someone ran up to the front of this line of people. So just think, like, here's here you are going up the mountain and – you know, like, let's say you're over here and you're going up. And then if Jared's way back here, well, at some point he's going to lag more and more. And I think really this was a sign that he was feeling the altitude sickness. Um, he was also, from what I understand, a new scout. And I'm going to get into some of the dynamics of that because he was a little bit old to be a new scout. Um, so that's just like probably, you know, two years less of kind of almost like training and conditioning you get from having been in that troop earlier and having done hikes and other activities. He just, you know, he it sounds like he was, I mean, now he wouldn't be hefty, but at the time he was a little bit hefty um, for his frame. So that, you know, just makes it harder to, to drag yourself up. I mean, I was super skinny. I was underweight and I was having a hard time. So I can only imagine if you're carrying an extra 20 or 40 pounds, it can be pretty brutal. So yeah, what happens is under the other version of the story, one of the other groups of people hiking up this hill, they run forward and they tell the leader, hey, you know, like your kid, Jared, he's lagging behind. Um, what do you want to do about it? And the leader, I think, I'm sure he regretted this now, but he decided that he wanted to forge forward and not like sacrifice the trip, you know, which is like, this is probably the only time they're going to get to do that this year. This is, you know, your one trip to summer camp for the year. He probably didn't want to sacrifice what they were doing for, you know, just one kid. So his thought was that Jared would stay behind. And then when they went back to the, down to the trail, they would pick him up and then they would all go back to camp. And, you know, sorry, Jared, you couldn't make it. Um, and this is where it gets a little weird. Now, I really have to admit that in terms of next steps and, and what may have happened here, I got to admit that in my Boy Scout troop, we really like weren't sure what happened here. We we kind of we had we had some thoughts that weren't so charitable, because it was so inexplicable to us that anybody could have disappeared, that we started to make up some scenarios that almost sort of put the blame on Jared. And and I it was interesting when I read about this in Reddit, I was a little bit relieved to see that other people kind of wondered too aloud if maybe that had happened. So what, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is 
that from his point on in the story, what happens is that Jared is never seen again. And it's very clear that he left the spot, the resting spot up the mountain where he had been told or he had been told by somebody, either the leader or one of the other hikers to stay. And what we really wondered was, how did that happen? I mean, it looks like at some point he left. Why did he leave? What happened when he left? And where is he now? Because what happens is Jared leaves and he then becomes the subject of a massive search. So, you know, by massive search, I mean like just like people coming from all over the county um, and they're scouring this wilderness. And this wilderness is interesting because it's it's a wilderness that, that goes from like really high, dry, snowy alpine to like just to the east of it, just massive dry desert. It's pretty inhospitable uh, terrain. Um, I'm going to just kind of give you a sense of it really quick. But when I looked at the discussions and read it, it was interesting because people were giving a sense that like what you see here is a little bit deceptive. Like you can't really see all the vegetation that's on the mountain. You know, you look at the pictures of Mount San Gregorio and, you know, it looks like a lot of trees and stuff like that, but it's, it's not just that. I mean, it really could be something like, you know, it's definitely like very dry adjacent to this area. Um, and I think that's kind of a sense of the terrain and what's going on in the geography. Uh, geology has got a lot of the geology of the rock itself. So, you know, one of the reasons that makes it so famous is that it's sort of like this big mountain with a very steep aspect to it. Um, and there's a lot of loose rocks that they call scree and scraw uh, that can make scrambling up and down certain areas a little bit hazardous or a lot bit hazardous. There's also some big drop-offs and some big ledges. And the thought was that Jared, for whatever reason, deviated from where he was. And at some point, he is scrambling around in these mountains up above the hills. And nobody really knows why. Um, and unfortunately, no one really ever found him again. There was a, a multi-day search. Um, you know, he was carrying a blue two-quart canteen full of water at the time. Uh, the temperatures were warm enough even overnight for him to survive uh, without potentially going into hyperthermia, especially if he was carrying a little extra weight so he wasn't super skinny. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had a little bit of food with him. And really, you know, they did this, this big search. They searched a 130 square mile area of uh, the wilderness. Uh, as I mentioned, it's rocky and tree-lined. Uh, they eventually narrowed the search to a six square mile area where they found a footprint that matched one of his tennis shoes. And they also found what they thought was beef jerky and candy wrappers from him that may have been dropped. It's interesting he dropped it and didn't eat it. So I wonder if, you know, he may have been in a, a bit of a panic at that point. And finally, most importantly, there's a famous picture that they found. And the picture is one that Jared took of himself. Now, that picture, I think, is is pretty disturbing in a way because it kind of, it makes you sort of feel really bad for him. Here's that picture of Jared Negrete. And uh, by the way, if I switch back and forth between calling him Jared Negrete and Jared Negrete, uh, I apologize. You know, I think when we anglicize names, uh, which has happened to my last name as well, uh, sometimes we pronounce it the way it's not supposed to be. But, you know, Jared is from a family where, whose surname definitely should be pronounced as Negrete. And that's what I'll try to do going forward. So this picture is super famous because I think it's one of the few times where someone was able to kind of take a, a last photo of themselves before they disappeared. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here just to get a sense of what's going on. And you can't really tell much about it. I mean, if you look at him, you know, you can just see a little bit of detail around his face. Um, it's clear that the flash went off. So those 
old cameras, those little like no lens, you know, basic point and shoot cameras. Um, you know, they'd only take about 36 photos at the most, um, sometimes less than that, more like 24. But they're really not sure why he did it, whether he did it to leave a clue, which I think would be the charitable interpretation was maybe he was trying to make sure people knew it was his camera. Uh, the only other, only other photos in the camera were pictures of him, you know, pictures of like the scenery and, you know, as he had taken different shots along the hike, probably before he got tired. And, you know, if we just go ahead and progress with the rest of the, the story about what happened, um, frankly, after a long and, and arduous search that, you know, his parents participated in and that, you know, had a lot of attention on it. And like I said, it, it was well known to us in the L.A. area and probably all of California. I mean, it's a very heart, you know, touches your heartstrings, the story, because you have, you know, it looks like a really nice kid, you know, by all descriptions, he was really, really nice, uh, had a high enthusiasm for photography. So sounds like I would have liked him because as you can see behind me, those photos behind me are mine. Um, that's one of the things I do. So if you ever look me up, you might find a lot of my stock photography and stuff on Flickr. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he sounds like he's a, he's a pretty nice kid. Uh, he was involved in Boy Scouts. So what's wrong with that? Nothing. Um, sounds like his family's religious and, you know, believes in, you know, I guess family values and things like that. So from that perspective, you certainly would want the best for him. But unfortunately, it just didn't turn out that way. And like I was alluding to earlier, it got to the point where we were kind of, I mean, some of it was gallows humor a little bit, um, but we really couldn't understand how it happened. So let's go through the, the scenarios really quick. Like, what would make someone leave a rest area like that and end up in a situation where nobody could find them? And presumably he died out there in the wilderness, even though they never found his body. And there was a lot of speculation. Okay, so the scenario that we were thinking about was that maybe he was a little resentful for getting left behind by these other boys and by the adult leader, and that maybe he decided to play a trick on them. That sounds really awful, doesn't it, that we thought that, but we couldn't understand how else he could have ended up lost. And I have to admit, for the longest time, I kind of still put some weight into that theory. I have to admit that from the scenario we looked at, we're like, well, how could someone have left where he was and then just disappeared? So we thought, well, maybe he decided to just jump off the trail a little bit. And then when everybody came back and didn't find him, there'd be a little bit of chaos and consternation. And why did we leave him behind? And, and I, I said that because I remember the resentment from some of the younger scouts uh, when you were on a trail that maybe, you know, you're an older boy now and you're stronger and you can do the hike. And then you have these kids that were brand new and we're not used to hiking, you know, three, five, 10 miles at a time, even 20 sometimes. And you know, there's also like a little bit of hazing going on in terms of like, well, you're new and you need to get used to it. You know, just like, I mean, almost like a, like a boot camp or something where it's like, you're going to get stronger, kid, but we got to push you. And maybe our theory at the time was maybe he decided to teach them a lesson. And I'm happy to say, as much as it makes the rest of us look bad, that I don't really stick with that theory anymore. But I'll stick a pin in that. We'll come back to that real quick. So some of the other theories were, well, maybe he was kidnapped. And I, I, I've seen that out there. I, I think that's ridiculous. I mean, it would be super, it would be ridiculous to try to kidnap some, somebody from a mountain in front of a bunch of other hikers and drag him down the hill. I mean, there's a lot easier ways to kidnap somebody than to do it from this really remote yet crowded because it's California. So there's a lot of people on the trail, hiking trail, and then drag him, you know, three miles down a hill to some other vehicle. I just think that would have been enormously obvious and other people would have seen that it happened. It would have been really hard to do it um, for reasons I'll mention. So then people say, well, they could have cut the trail and gone across it. Well, unfortunately, it, the, the way these trails are, if you try to cut the trail, that's how you could get hurt. And that's maybe what potentially happened. Now, one of the other theories that I put more stock into, though I don't say it's the solution, is that perhaps what happened is Jared had 
gone and maybe tried to catch up with the troop again. And there's like kind of two branching things here. One is like maybe he decided to cut the trails, like I just mentioned, because when you see these switchbacks, switchbacks are like when the trail goes back and forth up a mountain. So because it's really hard to go straight up a hill like that, it's pretty steep. Um, It's easier instead to like go back and forth. You walk longer, but you don't, you don't, you're not trying to climb like a a 30 or 40% grade, which is really hard. You'll burn out your legs really fast. But especially if you're not that experienced or you're younger and you have more energy, you look at that and you're like, well, this is ridiculous. Like, why am I going to go a hundred yards out of my way? Let's just climb up that. So one of the thoughts was maybe he did that. Maybe he tried to climb. Maybe he tried to shorten the path and then got lost. Now, something else that I think is maybe also a likely scenario is that because there's so many trails and there's branching signs that he may have ended up going down, like making a left when he should have made a right. And as dumb as that sounds, I think it is actually pretty plausible. And I'm going to explain in a little while why. Finally, um, people mentioned, well, there's well, there's wild animals up there, like maybe mountain lions or bears. And one of them could have grabbed them and dragged it off into the wilderness. Once again, I, I, there isn't really any record of that happening up there. Um, you know, there are coyotes and there are some amount of wilderness around there. The mountain lion attacks, frankly, happen a lot more like more often, like down here in L.A. County, like closer to sea level. Like I would say there's been more mountain lion attacks here in the San Fernando Valley where I live or even close to like L.A. City, um, you know, in Griffith Park and uh, Santa Monica Mountains and places like that. Uh, than there ever have been up in, you know, the San Bernardino wilderness or San Gorgonio. So that's not really high on my list. Um, Though I will admit potentially um, his body could have been scavenged later by any number of wilderness animals. Okay. So, you know, from that perspective, I think it's interesting to think about, well, First of all, what went wrong here? What went wrong here is that, um, unfortunately, it looks like the scoutmaster or the acting scoutmaster, Dennis Knight, may have violated scouting policies. So one of the policies Boy Scouts has is whenever you have a trip, well, first you need to file paperwork, which uh, the, the I think it was the, the Long Beach Council said, no, he never filed paperwork about this trail. I mean, he, sorry. The Long Beach Council said he never filed paperwork about this trip. So that was just kind of a, a paper trail to make sure that people knew you were on this trip and who was going. And, you know, in case something happened, um, you know, I, let's say it was a bigger group of people, it would make it easier to audit, like, well, who was on this trip so you could keep track of, of what happened. Okay. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, I think, especially because this has come up a lot in the news, um, let's face it. You don't really want to be in a situation as an adult leader um, or as a, as a teenager where there's not more than one adult in, in charge. So I would say from, from when, when a lot of reasons, like I've seen a lot of Boy Scout trips, unfortunately, like this is not so unfamiliar that a Boy Scout trip uh, has something bad happen. Someone gets hurt or we get lost or, you know, other things happen. It, I could tell you stories. I'm not going to drag it out. But let's say an adult leader by himself could either make a bad decision and maybe that bad decision could be um, trying to coerce somebody into something. Well, if you have another adult leader, um, that's probably not as likely to happen. It was greatly reduced unless he's in on it too. Uh, Maybe it also helps you keep your temper when you're managing a bunch of teenagers. Uh, It's sort of like, like you can, you can tag team and, and you know, one kid's being a jerk then one of the other adults kind of jumps in there and I've seen that happen plenty of times where some adults, you know, you, one adult's patience runs out, the other one jumps in there. But finally, I will say that just from like a managing multiple teenagers perspective, and especially with this hiking aspect, you always are supposed to have an adult leader at the end of the group of hikers for these, all these reasons we talk about, to, yeah, to make sure no one gets kidnapped, to make sure nobody falls down and nobody sees it, to make sure that a wild animal doesn't grab a kid and drag him off into the woods. And, you know, that sounds extreme, but, you know, it, it could happen as much as I've kind of discounted that possibility in this case. 
Um, it was interesting also because when I looked at this case on Reddit, and there are a couple of good Reddit threads, there was a whole bunch of people that said that they had been in a situation like this at high altitude or in a very challenging hike where they had essentially had some kind of health crisis or, or you know, altitude sickness or a combination of things where they started falling behind the trip. And, you know, when that was happening, they actually, they were so out of breath that they couldn't even tell anybody else on the trip what was happening. Like they, they literally, it was almost like they were a drowning person. They were drowning in, in the air and they were, you know, maybe collapsing in some way and nobody knew it. And it, it sometimes it took like other hikers, like what happened here, took other hikers to go tell their group like, hey, somebody at the end is, is falling behind. And that's one of the reasons why Boy Scouts has something called the buddy system which you're also supposed to apply to. So, you know, when I would go to summer camp or on some kind of trip with the scouts, you weren't ever supposed to go someplace alone. Like definitely not hiking alone. You weren't supposed to go swimming alone. You weren't, you know, and it, and it was explicitly in two pairs because it's hard for three, three people to keep track of each other. But when you kind of match two and two and two and two, it makes it really easy for one person to say, well, where's my buddy? And we would even do buddy checks. Um, for swimming activities where they would say buddy check and everybody have to raise their hand and like hold their buddy's hand and say, oh, there he is. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. And I think that's probably the major fault here is that if let's say the adult leader left even another boy behind uh, with Jared, maybe some of the decisions that happened afterwards or whatever happened wouldn't have happened. Um, But really like he probably shouldn't have left someone behind. They probably should have either canceled the trip or slow down uh, at risk of maybe being there later, which maybe was like like not a, a viable option um, so that Jared could make it up. For whatever reason, they were they were doing something that was a pretty, it's known as a pretty extreme hike. It's pretty accelerated. I don't think it was a good hike for a new boy. Okay, so like I said, for the longest time, I, I just really harbor, harbored my doubts about what happened here. I didn't, I didn't think it was possible that he could have gotten lost unintentionally. Um, from my perspective, I felt that he had maybe done something to cause his himself getting lost. And that's, like I said, it's not a really nice thing to think, but we just couldn't help but kind of think of other boys and young men in the troops that we'd been in. Saw a lot of spiteful behavior. Uh, it's definitely like, like the, what I call the asshole age for boys. Um, 12, 13 is where, um, you know, men, boys and men specifically go transition in hormones and their mind. And it's kind of a a problem year where there's a lot of like kind of semi antisocial or rebellious activity around then. I would say 17 is also another age for that. Um, but we'll save that for another day. All right. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, interestingly, almost exactly 10 years later. So in August of 2001, so this is like um, 10 years and a month after this happened, there was actually another lost hiker who I I believe was a Boy Scout also. And it was actually from my hometown of Woodland Hills. So, you know, I'm surprised I don't even, I didn't know him uh, or one of his relatives. Um, But what happened was uh, almost the same exact situation. Uh, there was a boy hiking, boy, a boy, really, I should say, young man. Uh, he was 17 years old. His name is William Parvin. Uh, like I said, from, I mean, like, like he could have lived next door practically. Uh, he's hiking up the mountain uh, in August of 2001 with his father and his 12 year old sister. And interestingly, his sister's the same age, right? His sister's 12 years old, and she gets altitude sickness. And by that, you know, he, means that she starts lagging behind and having a hard time and having a hard time breathing. So his father stayed back with his sister and, you know, he's like 17. He's got all the testosterone going. It's, you know, you're you're really strong at that that point. And he's like, oh, I want to keep going. And I'll wait for you guys up at the top. And he goes and it really does seem like he made a wrong turn. So as much as I didn't think and the other scouts in my troop, we were like, "Eh, you don't make a wrong turn. Like you're going up, right? Go up the hill, go up to the top. Well, apparently it wasn't so easy. Apparently even this this kid, um, William Parvin, who apparently was a very accomplished uh, hiker, you know, had had had, you know, plenty of experience doing this, 
somehow he made a wrong turn. And this, I think, you know, it shows you that even someone experienced can make the same mistake, was that once he was lost, instead of staying in one place and waiting for people to find him, he kept hiking more and more. And no joke, he was gone for about four days and Jared Negrete's father, Philip Negrete, even joined in the search for him. You know, I, there's an article you can find where like they, they kind of think like William at this point is dead. Like they don't, they've kind of almost given up. They're like, oh, it's going to be just like Jared. We don't find him. And lo and behold, what happens was he pops up. He pops up way down the mountain. He pops up near this little town uh, down at the base of the, the mountain. And what happens is he tells a story. And his story is that he was hiking for something like 30 or 40 miles over these four days, which, you know, is, is amazing, um, given that he really didn't have any food. Uh, at that point. And uh, he ran out of water. He was drinking out of creeks. Uh, he, he reported seeing both bears and dogs, but he also reported hallucinating. Um, and, you know, at some point he realizes he's lost and he goes to the summit again. And unfortunately, the summit of the hill is pretty big. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, you could be like over here and still be miles and miles away if you just like, like measure it, I mean, you can see it's like, it's like, it's not on the map. It's, it's short, but you know, you could, you could even potentially be on, be near the tops of one of these other mountains and not really know it. And, you know, you can see there's, there's like just a lot of different directions. It's not like super obvious, I think, where you are necessarily. So, you know, the other thing that, to know is that when you're lost, you often kind of go in circles and, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to get disoriented unless you have a compass with you, which would be a good thing to have. Um, so, you know, he, he, he said he, over the next three days, <laughs> which presumably if he didn't hallucinate them, he saw several small black bears, which didn't pay any attention to him, said wild dogs followed him a couple of times. Um, the weather was mild, but his nights were still cold. I believe that. I mean, you know, even summer nights here, can be in the 60s and up at that altitude, uh, you can be pretty cold. I would imagine that the, the temperature might get closer down to the 50s or 40s. Um, now, here's something important was that he actually fell off of cliffs and had bruised ribs and a slight concussion. So that's the part where I wonder, especially given that photo that Jared took of himself at night, he could have fallen off a cliff or a ledge and then laid there hidden in the bushes mortally injured or dead uh, people one of the, the redditors pointed out that the kind of brush there is very dense and it's about waist high and when you're in it it's actually really hard to find you I mean it's possible animals might not have even found him uh, that maybe his body is laying around there mummified somehow um, he said they drank from the creek he washed his wounds with water he actually lost his flashlight in the fall so once again he actually made his situation worse. Not only did he tire himself out trying to find him, you know, find his way back, but he lost equipment. He almost got killed. I mean, he got a, a pretty significant injury. A concussion is not anything to laugh at for sure. Um, and, you know, he's tiring himself out meanwhile. So even let's say if, you know, the, the helicopter comes, um, in this case, a helicopter did come. He saw a helicopter, but he was too far inside a ravine. So his efforts had actually made himself harder to find. Um, and it's presumably you would even maybe not even have the energy at some point to signal. Um, finally, he comes to Whitewater Creek, which cuts through the southeast side of the mountain. Uh, his five twenty, He had five 24-ounce bottles of water, which he all drank. Um, he got a little bit sick, he said, from drinking from the creek, but for sure like if you don't if you have like 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 bad water or nothing you should drink the bad water because with nothing you'll you'll die um and finally he actually went all the way down to the town of whitewater uh where he was like right at the edge of the desert so i'm just going to find that really quick here
I mean, that's significant. Look at that distance between where he was at and where he ended up. I mean, that just shows you how far you can wander um, lost. I mean, that is a voyage. That that voyage would have definitely killed a lot of people. And just measuring it as the crow flies, it's about, what, 16 miles or so? Yeah, so that's, you know, and that, that was on top of all the other efforts he made to get back up the hill. So, wow, what a what a, an ordeal. So, you know, coming out of that, it's interesting, as I said, uh, he, he shows up in like 8.45 in the morning. So actually, the, I think literally the day they wrote that article or the day after um, where they interviewed um, Jared's father, uh, he shows up. It's this, this trout farm, um, <laughs> raises uh, rainbow trout to stock lakes. Um, he says that not staying put and losing the flashlight were probably his two biggest mistakes. Uh, and I think he's right. Um, it was interesting that he actually, you know, there's, there's a movie called the edge with Alec Baldwin and Anthony Hopkins. It's a really great movie. It's based on a Michael Crichton novel. Um, it's from the late nineties. It's really one of my favorites. And I, it's, there's like kind of a, a part where they get lost in the woods for various reasons in the plot twist. And I don't know if this is true, but the main character, Anthony Hopkins tells Alec Baldwin's character that a lot of times people die of shame. Now, I don't know if that's just a Michael Crichton plot twist, but it was interesting because it, it does sound like the people's efforts to get refound often counterproductive to them actually getting found, um, tiring themselves out and maybe getting themselves injured, maybe are, are fueled by this. I also say that it's interesting. I also say that it's interesting that um, this case, William actually apologized profusely. I mean, he was like, he was delirious for one thing. He was hallucinating, but he was apparently apologizing the whole time to the the, the guy who was driving him back to civilization and to help because, um, you know, he's dehydrated, he's injured. Um, and he's saying he's sorry when really, I mean, there's nothing to be sorry for. I mean, he didn't do this on purpose. Everybody is definitely super happy. Uh, everyone's probably really relieved uh, to see him alive. I mean, to have him actually come out of this unscathed. But I'll really say that, uh, oh, you know, after, I'll really say that after looking at this, my thoughts were, you know what? Now I feel a lot more charitable about what may have happened to Jared. I mean, I think that Probably he, he got his wind back or, or, you know, really felt the pressure to, you know, come back up and, and try to try to accomplish the task. You know, I mean, imagine being the only one out of a group of five who's not going to make it to the top of the hill. I mean, I uh, kids can be jerks anyway. So I remember like I, I skipped a hike one time on summer. I someone to do it. Eh, not interested. And no joke. These jerks gave me a hard time for two days that I didn't that I didn't want to wake up at 530 in the morning and go hike up, up the stupid mountain that I had no interest in because uh, at that point I was like yeah I'm not gonna do that anymore um, yeah so I'm not like super I, I, so from that point of view I keep on thinking that yeah I think what probably happened is, Jared, really in good faith, had made an effort to catch up with the troop. And whether or not he cut the trail or did something foolish that just, I mean, not even foolish, just didn't have experience, right? Did something that seemed to make sense to him and seemed logical. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm behind on time. Maybe I can catch up by taking a shortcut. Or even more innocently, he made a left when he should have made a right, made a right when he should have made a left. And... There you are. Um, it's unfortunate because, yeah, like like I, I can't help but think that, you know, it's such a – that decision or not even a decision that – that I can't help but think that that was really what ended up being the end of his life. Now, I think at this point it's worth talking a little bit about what you should do if you're lost. And actually, I have my my Boy Scout handbook. This is my Boy Scout handbook from when I was like 10. 
Uh, and then later on, they did a reprinting. I, I actually like this one because it had all these cool like drawings from like from literally from Norman Rockwell. So it's probably like old intellectual property. Um, and then you have this other one, which was the reprint, which was probably the one that uh, Jared had. Um, and what's kind of cool is it has actual stuff in there about what you're supposed to do when you're lost. So real quickly, we're going to go into it. So what I thought I would do is first, I, I have some general thoughts about getting when you get lost. I mean, in terms of having equipment that's helpful, I think it, it, it does make sense. I mean, these days with a phone, you have a GPS and that can help. Um, phones run out of power. So having one of those power packs uh, with a charging cable, uh, just power packs you can buy that can charge up your phone like four or five times. So that will really help in terms of both having something to signal with, uh, having something, to, of course, to record what's going on, uh, having something that is shiny so you can even reflect off the glass surface. Uh, but also just in terms of a GPS and knowing when you are, obviously GPS wasn't even really a thing for civilians in 1991. Almost nobody had one of those. Barely even anybody had a cell phone back then. So obviously Jared Negrete didn't really have that option. I would say even William Parvin in 2001 probably didn't have a cell phone either because you know they were still relatively expensive and rare. Um, it also helps to, on top of a compass, which is pretty inexpensive, a lot of compasses come with a mirror. Uh, the mirror is there for a couple of reasons. Uh, I would also say if you have like a, 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 both men and women these days might have like a makeup compact that can be used to signal. You say, well, what's the signaling part? Well, if a helicopter is looking for you or someone else is looking for you, light goes a very long distance. Light can go 30 or 40 miles. Um, and if you can flash something in the sun to somebody above you, even if you don't know Morse code, it's good to have something like that available to be able to, you know, get the attention of somebody somewhere. And, you know, I think we should all know SOS. SOS is dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. So bump, 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 bump. So short, 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 long, 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 short, short, short. And that's like an international uh, distress signal. And it's well known. So that's something that could actually get someone to call help for you if you don't have a cell phone or, you know, all those other reasons. Someone way across the valley or down a hill or on top of a hill might actually call 911 for you and just say, hey, Rangers, there's somebody signaling SOS. So even if you're, you're down, you know, you broke your ankle or something, that can really help. I'm actually going to go ahead and read a quick passage from my little Boy Scout handbook from 1987, I think, when we bought it. I'll, I'll have a couple of pictures as well for this. So here's the passage on what you're supposed to do if you get lost. So um, the main rule for not getting lost is to know at all times where you are. Well, that sounds a little, a little simple. I don't know that that was ever so true. And uh, I can remember, like I'll tell you, uh, one of my, my trips to the Boy Scout camp, me and another kid snuck off to find like <laughs> this legendary stash of like candy and crap up in the, in the hills that was in some kind of supply trailer. And we found it, but like we weren't going to break in. We, I don't even know why we went to go see it because we weren't going to steal from it. But it was, you know, nine o'clock at night. It was dark, maybe closer to 10. And when we were going back, even though we knew the way and day, uh, you know, we'd been in this camp a bunch of times, we actually did get kind of lost. And I remember there was kind of a, an oh crap moment for about 10 minutes until we finally were able to find what was a fairly wide dirt road back to camp but you know but you know we had enough of a like oh crap moment that I, I was really starting to worry that we were going to have to hunker down and wait for people to find us and that that would have been embarrassing so I can kind of understand when someone tries to get, get themselves found because we did the same thing and maybe we just got lucky uh, who knows it says here that you know when you hike with your troop be alert no the directions of roads, streams you cross, uh, landmarks, things like that. Uh, I don't think Jared was that experienced enough to do that. And frankly, William Parvin was and still didn't really work that well for him. He still ended up pretty lost. Um, 
It does say to always take along a map, map and a compass. In 1991, it was not so easy to get a map of everything like it is now, where you can just get it off the internet. And I never had a map of anything as a Boy Scout. Like the adult leaders sometimes did. In theory, they did. Um, but I remember us going on a big canoe trip and nobody had a friggin' map. So, yeah, you know, uh, uh, things happen. But best practices are you should do that. Um, it says if you get lost by yourself, which shouldn't be by yourself, according to scout policy. Um, it says take it easy. So the most important thing is to remain calm, to take it easy, to sit down on a rock or under a tree and reason your way out. Um, and I'll say, I don't even know that you need to reason your way out. I kind of like the advice of just staying put if you're not confident. Like, let's say you've tried for about an hour or two hours and you can't find your way back. Every minute you spend doing something is tiring you out, using up your energy stores that you don't have much of left other than what's in your bag. And it may be making it harder for people to find you. So... That's something to, to understand. I think that some of this advice is probably for experienced Boy Scouts, but I don't even know that that's such such a good idea. It says here, under strayed from the patrol, which is presumably what happened to Jared, but if you ever become separated from your friends in a wilderness expedition, the thing to do is to let them find you rather than for you to attempt to find them. It says, as soon as your absence is noted, someone will start looking for you. So have, stay put and have faith that someone will find you. And then it says, prayer will help, yeah, maybe. Uh, make yourself as comfortable as possible and wait. Uh, and, you know, of course, it goes into other things like whether you, you can shout or if you have a whistle. So bringing a whistle will be another thing to bring on a hike. Um, it's a good idea. It's pretty easy. It makes a really loud noise and doesn't blow out your voice. Um, it says three columns of smoke. I wouldn't recommend starting a fire. Um, uh, you might actually burn down the forest around you and do a lot of damage. Uh, you know, which might save your life or may not save your life. Maybe it'll burn you down with it. So, you know, I, I think this is probably advice for places that are more moist where you could build some signal fires. But I would say the whistle, mirror, phone, obviously, or other GPS device, um, family radio, things like that. Those are good things to have in your pack. And really, like, they, other than the phone, and even phones can be extremely inexpensive depending on whether you just buy a spare one, um, GPS devices, It'll really help. Finally, it does mention that, you know, you should make sure to try to build yourself a shelter. Um, that can be easy. You can just lean up a branch against a tree and pile some other branches on it. Voila, you've got a shelter. Um, it does make sense, like on any kind of trip like this, to bring maybe a windbreaker, some long sleeves. I mean, I know I've even made the mistake of going places in L.A. during the summer when it was really hot. And then by nighttime, it was noticeably uncomfortable where you need a sweater like a Dodger Stadium or um, Hollywood Bowl, someplace like that. And for sure, up in the wilderness at 11,000 feet or 9,000 feet or however high up he was, um, yeah, you, do, you need to have enough clothes. So I don't know that they were that prepared when they did this. Um, and then it says, finally, it says, whatever you do, stay put, you will be found. By the way, it's, it's worth mentioning, I found some other funny books when I was looking through my old Boy Scout manual stuff, some of this was from a box that I had, and there was like a, <laughs> there was a, a, a computers, computers one. I can't even imagine what, uh, those are like probably 286s uh, back in uh, when they made this this thing, or 386s. There's railroading rare badge, which I never got. I think you had to build a model railroad, and for whatever reason, I couldn't get sign off on that. Uh, too bad. And there's Order the Arrow Handbook. Uh, apparently, the summer camp tamp to quits that he was from had something called the Order of the, the to quits. It was like a comp competitor. Order the Arrow is like an honor society that kind of has Native American um, stuff in it, Native American ceremonies and, and reverence for them, though maybe these days that'd be cultural appropriation. Um, so going into the close of the show, I'll say that, you know, I have some closing thoughts about this and then a, a final sign off. You know, a higher venture program like this has risks. I think there's some amount of it's assumed into it. Uh, pushing a kid into it alone is not a great move. So, uh, you know, I, I would always say if you're trying to challenge your child by putting them into like, let's say a scouting program and 
scouting is a lot more diverse and available for a lot more kids of different genders and you know than, than it used to be, especially in 1991. If you're going to do it, I, I would encourage you as a parent to become an adult leader with them. I mean, you know, my dad was an adult leader uh, when I was in Cub Scouts and then in Boy Scouts. But I remember the first summer camp I went to, for whatever reason, he couldn't go to it. And it was on Catalina Island. And I think that was one of the only times I ever felt, felt homesick, where it never felt so dark and weird as those first couple of days at that summer camp, where I think it was probably one of the first times I'd been, able, maybe the first time I'd been away from my family. No, you're with a bunch of people. You're literally there with hundreds of other boys and men, but it just felt really lonely and dark at night. Uh, you know, it's a very different scene than, you know, when you go to, I don't know, another city or something like that. Uh, and I think the only, the only part that was comforting was I realized that other kids also felt homesick. So you get a little bit of like a point where you hit the wall and you're homesick and and then you get over it and realize other people feel like that too and then you, you get over it but i would say that for the most part at least until i was a lot older if my dad wasn't there uh and he was almost always there i really missed him i think that you know it is an opportunity if you can spend the time with your child to do so and to have some really good memories and i have some really good memories with my dad from that so you know for him to be in this program without his father felipe um, I don't know. Maybe Felipe was busy. I do feel a little bit bad, though, that they didn't get this father-son time. I mean, summer camp goes during the week, so maybe, you know, dad's got to work. Mom's got to work. Um, and maybe that's why it happened like that. Um, I think also when I look back at this, you know, like I said, it was really disturbing to us, even despite the gallows humor and sort of uncharitable interpretations at the time. It was disturbing to us other Boy Scouts because – you know, that could have been us. It literally was a kid in our age bracket. It was a kid from Southern California, a kid from Los Angeles County. And this thing happened to him and he just disappeared and they never found him again. And it was really disturbing. I mean, especially as the case dragged on and the search ended and it became obvious that he probably was lying dead somewhere. You know, it was, it was pretty wor worrying to us. And, you know, it goes to show you you know, all these years later with the William Parvin case, it wasn't even about age because, you know, this other kid was way older, like 16 or 17. And he was able to, you know, still get lost in the same way. And he just, the only reason why he survived was maybe his greater experience and just sheer strength of being an older kid, uh, which, you know, Jared didn't have yet and probably would have a couple of years later. I think that Jared's body probably will turn up someday. Um, maybe mummified or dismembered, a piece of a bone. People have said, well, was he predated on by animals? I don't think so. I, I mean, just based on William's account, doesn't sound like the animals up there are so interested. Um, they may have scavenged his body later uh, if it was even in, you know, any kind of shape to be interesting to them. But, you know, it's not something I, I super wanted to think about. It is something that you know, I think would help the family feel at ease in terms of closing the loop on, you know, what happened with uh, his parents, Felipe and Linda. Um, they actually moved away from El Monte to Walnut, which is a, a neighboring community. And they adopted two more children in addition to their two biological children who were siblings of Jared. So, you know, they, they have kind of made peace with the whole thing. I mean, obviously they're extremely disappointed and, sad about it. I think they, you know, have accepted that he's probably gone. I mean, when I think about it, Jared would be, you know, my age. I'm almost 45 at this point. And he would have been in his early 40s, probably would have been married and had kids by then, maybe even have had a kid in a scouting program. So yeah, it's really sad when I think about it. So thank you for joining me today. Uh, I hope this case was as interesting for you as it was intense for me to revisit this case. Uh, I know I rambled a lot, but that's what an extra show is going to be. It's going to be Glenn rambling uh, and trying to trying to do it all in one show and, and, you know, put it all together for you guys. Please don't forget to subscribe 
And to catch all of our episodes on the Solvable Mysteries podcast, uh, please hit like, please hit subscribe. Remember, we have both a podcast and social media, so please feel free to visit us there. We enjoy interacting with you, and I look forward to the comments in this one. Thank you.